Ephesians 5.29 For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourished and cherished it, even as the Lord the church. So we can, that's, a, that's a great blessing right there. He's saying, just as selfish as you are with your body, and you want to pamper it and do it well, it's a fact. Christ thinks the same way about his bride, the church. God wants to do good. Uh, we naturally know how to do good to the people we like. He's no different. He likes to do us good. We're his bride. Okay, that's a cherished position. Verse 30. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bone. That is, he considers you one with him. When you get saved, you're put into Christ. You're part of him. Okay, Romans, Romans chapter 12. We understand that we are one body with Christ. Christ is in us and we're in him. Here's a new one on you. Romans 12 verse 5. So we, being many, are one. One, uh, one, are one body in Christ. Okay, we've already covered that. Now this is the new one. And everyone members one of another. Hmm. Well, no wonder the body of Christ, corporate, is a body. So all Christians are members of the same body. We're all connected. That's why it's important that you help your neighbor. If he's saved, <laughs> he's in the body of Christ. Another saved person should be functioning healthy. Because if he's not, it puts a drag on the whole body. Now, if all the Christians in all the world and all the different churches and all over were healthy, we would function as a strong, militant body. And that's why we're not anymore, because most aren't. 1 Corinthians 6, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 15. Here's one way Paul confronts it. 1 Corinthians 6, 15. Know you not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. So he says, what you do with your body, think about it. Is that what Christ wants done with his body? Because you're part of it. Oof. Look down at verse 16. What? Know you not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. So he says, you're you're taking a relationship that should be reserved for a husband and a wife and now you're basically cheating on God, cheating on Christ to join with a harlot. So he says, you can't do that because you're not even your own. You're part of Christ's body. So when you do that, you're saying Christ wants to do that. No, uh, no, that's, no, we know that ain't so. First Corinthians 12. That's not just Whatever, however you need to take it. <laughs> I'm just, well, there it is simply adultery. There it's a harlot. There it's clear. You, uh, I mean, you would have to work real hard to spiritualize that passage to turn it into something else. Um, that's a sexual sin he's talking about there. Um, but there's many places that you can... In Hosea, we're covering how that their worship was worshiping pagan gods, and God the Father, the husband of Israel, was saying, I consider that adultery to me. Uh, the, I reckon the passage that came to my mind was, that, I think it was in Psalms, where it says, if you're consenting unto a thief, uh, it is, it, you're committing adultery or something. Psalm 50, verse 18. When thou sawest a thief, then thou consentest with him, and hast been partaker with adulterers. Okay. So that's why I was asking. Is it, is it just... Because in the context that you had read in Corinthians, it sounded like it was just uh, uh, sexual. Um, anyway. I 
yeah, from my mom. Okay, so who is he talking to? To the wicked. No, no. He's talking to Israel. Okay, what verse? Okay, read verse 7, then read verse 16. Was that to me, Pastor? I'll read it. <laughs> or did you want me to read it out loud? Okay, You've, for, for context, you got to read the whole chapter, really. Okay. Verse 7. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, I will testify against thee. I am God, even thy God. Okay? Then you've got a paragraph where he does just that. Matter of fact, you got uh, a paragraph and a half. Verse 14, offer unto God thanksgiving. He's still talking to his people. Verse 15, call upon me in the day of trouble. Talking to his people. Verse 16, something has changed. But unto the wicked, God saith. So now he's changed subjects. This is spoken to the wicked. Uh, seeing thou hatest instruction and castest my words behind thee this is a scoffer uh, somebody who's uh, been con a wicked person who's been confronted with God's word and here's what he has to say to him uh, when thou sawest a thief then thou consentest with him and hast been partaker with adulterers two things they've done the uh, consenting with the thief was one thing and hast been partaker with adult uh, with adulterers two things they did okay. they consented to the thief saying yeah that sounds like a good plan go ahead or you know I'll help you if you need help with that they consented didn't say they participated but their consent was hey yeah go for it the other thing in the passage is adultery sexual he's not saying that I mean you'd have to prove it but I don't believe that he's saying that consenting with a thief is adultery because the word and I, I took it as it meant they got in bed with the thief they were consenting with him so they were okay what they were doing was wrong but, uh, well he would have to he's um <laughs> He's, uh, let's find out how he would have to word it in order to mean that. Well, I don't want to reword it. Well, no, the wording's important. Oh, yes, sir, I didn't um, say that. I know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm going to start over. Okay, here's, here's how we know. Simply remove the word and. When thou sawest a thief, then thou consentest with him, or and re replace the and with the thou. Thou hast been partaker with adulterers. But when he says the word and, he says, I, that ain't enough. Let me tell you the other thing I got against you. Okay. Uh, yeah, Corinthians 12, 12. <laughs> Whereas the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one, so also is Christ. So the body of Christ is a multitude now. It wasn't at the beginning when he was walking around on this earth. It wasn't made up of many. But now it is. That's why he came. He came to get a bigger body. <laughs> he was a bodybuilder. <laughs> and that's what he's doing. Ephesians 5 verse 31. Ephesians 5, verse 31. Did we cover all this already? I don't know. For this call shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one, uh, they too shall be one flesh. So he says, I've given marriage so that you can understand what Christ is. Christ and his 
Christians, the bride, the body of Christ, is just what a marriage is. The man leaves his father and mother. Okay, you leave all others to when you join Christ. You're not going to depend on Baal to help you. You're not going to depend on yourself to help you. Yeah. Okay. Um, I covered. Uh, I covered some of this, I think, because I talked about it's a man who leaves his father and mother. So you're not ready to marry unless you've left your mama and your daddy. <laughs> I think one of the worst things that a young couple can do is live in the same town as their parents. <laughs> because they'll drop in. Beyond that is you've got something to lean on. When life isn't happy, you run to mama and daddy like you always did growing up to get advice. When it should be the two of you asking the third party, God, for help. Um, you know how many people, um, how many women can marry, uh, uh, can a man marry? A man, according to the Bible, is supposed to leave father and mother and cleave to his wife, not his wives. <laughs> not like Salt Lake City. <laughs> They've got to have uh, a fallen angel come down and name baloney and tell them they dug up something, some some clay pots or something. Those are, those are golden tablets. <laughs> yeah. A little in a service, a little boy was asked, "How many women can a man marry?" And he said, 16. He said, "How do you know that?" <laughs> He said, all you got to do is the math. Four richer, four better, four worse, four poor. Four. <laughs> That's a pretty good deal. <laughs> no, sir. Talk about some trouble. <laughs> you can look all the way through the Old Testament. Anytime a man had more than one wife, he got a lot of trouble with it. Amen. Not a, I'm not saying from the woman, but God added trouble to his life. Uh, you find it all the way up to the end of David's life. I'm not saying there was anything sexual there, but there was something wrong with it. When he got, what was his? Uh, Abishag. Abishag, yes, the Shunammite. I mean, well, no, no, no. Are you talking about David or something? David. Yeah, I never liked that story. David. Immediately after that, what happens? Absalom. No, not Absalom. Uh, Adonijah. Adonijah. <laughs> Too many names sound alike. <laughs> yeah, war starts. Somebody's trying to steal the throne from him. Well, he wasn't doing what he was supposed to be doing. He should have figured that thing out. He had so many wives, every time he got one, he got into a new war. All the way through there. Uh, Ephesians 5, look at verse 32. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. So he says, I've been telling you about marriage, and marriage is mysterious. Because, not because marriage is mysterious, we think we understand that. He says, what's mysterious is Christ and the church. That's why marriage was given to begin with. Isaiah uh, 54, Isaiah 54. Isaiah 54, verse 5. He says, For thy maker is thy husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy redeemer, the Holy One of, what's that word? Israel. Israel. The God of the whole earth shall he be called. So God has a bride too. And his bride is right there in our verse, Israel. So we'll learn some things from what God's revealed about his bride in the Old Testament that'll show you what the Godhead considers a bride in that relationship. Look at Isaiah 62. Isaiah 62 verse 4. Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate, but thou shalt be called Hephzibah, and thy land Beulah, for the Lord delighteth 
in thee, and thy land shall be married. Um, okay, so the, God's saying, I'm not going to forsake my people. Now, he's proved to them he's going to put them in time out. He's punishing them. He did. They're still in time out. They'll come back. And he says there, I'm going to bless everything you've got. Now, that's a pretty good husband, isn't it? That he's got ability to do things humans can't. He's got control over everything, the heathen included. Uh, John chapter 3. John chapter 3, verse 29. This is an interesting passage. John the Baptist is still considered Old Testament, uh, that time period. And so he would be considering who would his... Who would he be the bride of in the Old Testament? We just read it in Isaiah. Who was the Jew the bride of? Father, God. God the Father. Mm -hmm. Correct. So John the Baptist would be considered the bride of God the Father. The Old Testament system. John three twenty nine. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This is my joy, uh, this my joy therefore is fulfilled. He's saying, I'm the friend of the bridegroom. Uh, so he's not part of what Jesus Christ was considering his bride. And he recognized that. People don't recognize it now. They think you'll find these people who think that all of the Bible is the same dispensation. There's no such thing as dispensations. Well, right there, he's clearly made a distinction between God the Father has a bride and Jesus Christ has a bride. And I'm a friend of Jesus Christ, and he's a bridegroom. But it wasn't his bride. He wasn't, it wasn't the bridegroom of him. Or he would have said, my bridegroom. Uh, Second Corinthians. I don't know how y'all can figure all that out. I, I'm all tongue twisted now. I can't figure out what I just said. Okay, Second Corinthians 11. Second Corinthians 11, verse 2. Paul. Now Paul's going to clarify the bride and who, who we're talking about. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So there we understand. In his dispensation, he's saying... The bridegroom is Christ. And if you're saved, that's you're the bride of Christ, who, who is your bridegroom. Look at it in Revelation, Revelation 19. Revelation 19, we're going to verse 7, but I need to look up something. Okay, Revelation 19, 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Okay, that's Christ coming back, and he's coming back with his wife. It only took uh, 2,500 years for her to get ready. Mm -hmm. That's like a bride. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's finally ready. We can finally rejoice. <laughs> that's, that's not God's bride. That's Jesus Christ's bride. Ephesians 5 verse 33. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself. And the wife see that she reverence her husband. Okay, so there's a hierarchy here. And there's duties that are associated with each position. Ephesians 5, look back up at verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Okay, so there's a position. He's told us this whole chapter. This was a great mystery. I told you all of this for a reason. It's because Christ has a bride, and that's you. 
Genesis chapter 3. Genesis 3 verse 16. Genesis 3, 16. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. So, what does that mean? That means life's going to be tough. <laughs> and it is. That didn't mean God's mad at you. That's life. That's part of this cursed earth that we live on. He says... I'm going to multiply thy conception. Notice how he adds a blessing right behind. Uh, it's going to be rough. <laughs> it's negative, then a positive. A child is supposed to bring joy to you. He's going to multiply the conception because the sorrow's been multiplied. He's not mean. He says, In sorrow thou, sh uh, thou shalt bring forth children. And thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. So, for Christians, the fact of the matter is Christ is supposed to rule over us. We can be a rebellious bride, <laughs> or we can be a dedicated bride. It's up to us. He's supposed to be ruling over us. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews 12, verse 9. Hebrews 12, 9. Furthermore, this is after saying, you know, this passage. <laughs> this is a tough passage. It's on chastisement. He says, Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh, which corrected us, and we gave them, what's that? Reverence the wife supposed to see that she reverence her husband it's the same relationship also the same duty as a child is supposed to have with their parents reverence he says uh, we had our fathers that beat us to death and we gave them reverence <laughs> shall we not much rather be in what's that word subjection, subjection. so Reverence is being in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live. <laughs> he doesn't beat you to death. <laughs> first Peter, first Peter three. First Peter three, verse two. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be uh, that outward adorning of plaiting of hair and wearing of gold and putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in, which, uh, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which in the sight of God is of great price. Okay, there's reverence. A meek and quiet spirit. It didn't say mouth. It said spirit. Now, those could go hand in hand, but not necessarily. Uh, it doesn't mean that you've got to be a, a church mouse that never says anything. That's not what he's saying. He's saying the spirit, the attitude, is meek and uh, in subjection. Verse 5. For after this manner in old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being in subjection unto their own husbands. So... For us, before God, we should all have a meek and quiet spirit. It's not so much, I mean, it is important for you to pray, but it's less important for you to be speaking as it is for him to be speaking. And when we go to the word of God, we need to go to it not with our mouth open, <laughs> but with our ears open. Because if we're not careful, we'll go to the Bible and start trying to tell it what it says. Hmm. Instead of letting the Bible teach, that's what the Bible wants to do. Now, it's natural. It's natural to go to the Bible and not have a full understanding. That's normal. I mean, God knows we're stupid. <laughs> that's why he gave us the Bible. <laughs> but 
what's not right is to go to the Bible and say, I'm going to find this. <laughs> you might not. <laughs> you might find something that looks like that and that's a time bomb waiting to blow up on you. A lot of times the Bible will appear that it's saying something on purpose. So you study and say, did I see what I thought I saw? Now that's God speaking when you go research statutes and vanity. You'll find out what that means. <laughs> uh, Ephesians 6. We finished a whole chapter. We did it. Ephesians 6. Okay, unfortunately, in the book of Ephesians, we've reached the end of the book. Not the end, but you know what I mean. We're toward the end. <laughs> and so he's gotten real practical. He said, I've given you all the principles I'm going to. And now I'm just going to make applications because I want to make sure you understand what I've been saying. So we've seen the husband-wife relationship. Now he moves on. He moves on to children. Ephesians 6 verse 1. We should all love this. Nobody in here is a child. Ephesians 6 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Yes, it is. Uh, he says, this commandment is in the Lord. Therefore, the instruction here is given to a Christian family, not to the lost world. Um, God's view of marriage, we've already seen, is what God's joined together. So it's those children who had better obey their parents because that's been, uh, it's of the Lord, it's been uh, sealed by his stamp of approval what God's joined together. Um, so he says that uh, you're to be doing that. Look at Exodus chapter 2. No, 21. It's been a long day. <laughs> Is it 2 or 21 or do you just go to both? Yeah, do all of those. Mm -hmm. Exodus 21. In the Bible, all the way from way back in the beginning, you found this to be true. If a child did not obey his parents, he was in danger of death. That sounds cruel, but it sure would get some children to obey, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it was uh, pretty harsh. Now, I'm not saying that you kill any kids nowadays. Don't take that the other. <laughs> Exodus 21 verse, 12, uh, verse 17. 21 17. And he that curseth his father or his mother shall what? Surely be put to death. Surely be put to death. Whew. I think you would learn respect and obedience and honor real quick. <laughs> you wouldn't need to see more than one of those or hear about it. Proverbs chapter 20. Proverbs 20, verse 20. Whoso curseth his father or his mother, his lamp shall be put out in obscure darkness. So God says, even if you got away with it, I'll see to it your lamp is put out in obscure darkness. Now what's your lamp? Your understanding, your enlightenment, what lightens things up, what makes you have understanding. Right. He said, I'll put it out in obscure darkness. You won't understand. Now, you may go to the Bible. The Word of God is supposed to be our lamp and light. You may go to it, but he's going to hide it so your understanding won't be opened. Um, one of the prayers you find Paul praying is that um, the eyes of our understanding being enlightened. So just having the Bible, if the teacher don't come down and explain it to you, you got no enlightenment. Matthew chapter 15. Matthew 15 verse 4. They say that Old Testament was hard and cruel and mean. But now we've got the New Testament and Jesus is nice. He's everybody's buddy. 
and you really want that because that saves you from that mean ogre of God the Father. Let's find out. Let's go ask Jesus about it. Matthew 15, verse 4. Jesus speaking. For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. Wow. He was serious about it too. You better honor them parents. Wow. <laughs> Obedience is doing what you're told to do. Um, and it's more than just obedience in the Bible. It's honor. Honor is doing it with the right attitude. Wow. Titus chapter 2. Titus 2 verse 9. Exhort servants. Now this is servants, but it's going to explain the same relationship. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things. <laughs> uh, it would be nice if the verse ended there. But he gets real practical. He says, and don't think you can be a smart aleck. Not answering again. Ooh, and shut your mouth and move your feet. <laughs> wow. Okay, Ephesians 5, look at verse 24. Ephesians 5, 24. Our attitude or a child's attitude toward his parents should be the same as our attitude toward Christ. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ. Okay, the child is supposed to be subject to his parents. Just like a servant is supposed to be subject to his master. And how should you be subject to him? You obey without complaining. <laughs> you, uh, how did he put it there? He said, not answering again. That is, don't tell him you don't like it. Don't tell him it's not fair. Mm. Isn't that the, that's the standard little kid response. It's not fair. Well, they don't have a clue what fair is. Okay, God does the same with us. Don't tell God anything you're going through is not fair. Just like you with a little child, God knows more about what's fair than you do for the little, little kid. 1 Corinthians 11. First Corinthians 11, verse 3. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. There's a hierarchy. It goes all the way up. Uh, look down at verse uh, 11. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither is the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. Okay, do you understand what he's saying there? <laughs> he's saying it doesn't matter, married or not married, uh, if, you, if you've got a man that's over you or not, all are subject to God. So we can all be in subjection to someone. <laughs> and we never have a shortage of who we should be in subjection to. <laughs> Ephesians 6, look at verse 2. We're going to... I'm going to ask you a question about this verse. Ephesians 6, verse 2. Well, let me just ask it on the front end. and I mean, we'll read the verse and find it in a minute. What is the first commandment in the Bible? No, the, of the Ten Commandments, what's the first commandment? Okay. Yeah, I went all the way to the first one I could find. So, maybe. Um, thou shalt have no other gods. Right. 
Go to the gods before me. Yeah. What's the great commandment? Love the Lord thy God with all your heart and soul. Mm -hmm. That's right. So now you know two commandments that are not this commandment. Those are two good commandments, and they have firsts, but it's not this first. He's going to give us a commandment and claim it's a first, but it's not the first we probably have been taught. We've been taught the first commandment. Now, if you're a Jew, you're taught a different first commandment. The Jew is taught the Lord our God is one Lord. They're taught that's the first commandment. And they've got them all out of order. Our first commandment is uh, love the Lord thy God with all their heart, soul, and mind. Uh, no other gods before me. The first commandment uh, or the greatest commandment is love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind. The second's likened to it, uh, love your neighbor as yourself. This one he says, honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Okay, this one has a promise. Now, we've seen it already. Do you remember the promise we saw on this commandment? Well, that we've seen in the Old Testament. Because he said that honor your father and mother is an Old Testament commandment. And it came with a promise. We've already seen it in the Old Testament. The promise is if you don't honor them, they can kill you. Curse them and die the death. Curse them and I'll put your light out in obscurity. Oh, that's the promise. It's a promise there. Now, most people miss that one. Yeah, it's the first time I've seen it. Yeah, it's there. <laughs> now, let's find it in the Bible. Exodus chapter 20. Exodus 20, verse 12. There was no Joel Osteen in tonight. I couldn't find his notes on this. So. <laughs> no, he would have skipped all Exodus 20, verse 12. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. So, you get something good, too. If you will do it, it comes with a blessing. If you won't do it, it comes with a curse. Both of those are a promise. God will do whichever one you land on. Ooh. Deuteronomy 27. Deuteronomy 27, verse 16. All of Israel is supposed to go out here. Half of them are going to stand on this mountain. Half of them are going to stand on this mountain. Some of them are going to yell some blessings, and some of them are going to yell some curses. Both of those are promises. Deuteronomy 27, verse 16. Cursed be he that setteth light by his father or his mother. And all the people shall say, Amen. That is... If you don't think it's important what your parents say, you think it's light, it's, it's vanity, it's empty. He says, and all the people are supposed to agree with this, and he made them do it. This side would say one curse, this side would say a blessing. All the people would agree to it. Amen, amen. That's good preaching. <laughs> Ephesians 6, Ephesians 6 verse 3. Now the part of the, the promise that everybody likes and that Paul's including here. That it may be well with thee and thou mayest, and thou mayest live long on the earth. That promise is still in effect. That's an Old Testament promise but it's still in effect in the New Testament. Don't let anybody tell you that God has eliminated the Old Testament by giving us a New Testament. He's not. Or else Paul was incorrect to include it. No. Unless God makes it clear, I'm no longer doing this, then we still do it. He says right here, you're, you'll live long uh, and you'll have, it'll go well with you. You'll have a good life if you'll do this. Look at Romans chapter 13. Romans 13, verse 6. 
If you'll get in a habit of honoring your father and your mother, you probably won't dishonor the police. Romans 13, verse 6. For this cause pay ye tribute also. Why? Because he's got a sword, that's why. For they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues. Tribute to whom tribute is due. Custom to whom custom. Fear to whom fear. Honor, there it is, honor, to whom honor. Okay, so honor your parents. It's do them. But don't just stop there. <laughs> You'll outgrow the parents' house at some point. For some reason, children always grow up. <laughs> Keep feeding them. <laughs> Keep feeding them. <laughs> then there's somebody else still to honor. That was just training ground. Right. You still have to honor the governmental rules. You still have to do as you're told. You still have to respect the, the government's rules and regulations. You can't just drive 95 because you feel like it. <laughs> Ephesians 6, verse 4. Ephesians 6, verse 4. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Okay, so it's not uh, in your child rearing. He put a side note in here because he said, I like the way he laid this out. Don't you like the way he laid it out? He said, I'm going to tell you, it seems like it's disjointed, but it's not. He says, I'm going to tell you about the relationships you'll have on earth. They're a picture of your heavenly relationship. And he says, I'm going to start with the husband and the wife. And we went through that. Then he says, okay, now let's talk about children. Children, you get right and you obey and you respect. Then he threw this in here, verse 4. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to... Wait, I'm, we're not talking about fathers anymore. We're on, to, we're on to telling them little rug rats what they're supposed to be doing. <laughs> he said, no, I know you'll enjoy telling the kids what the responsibilities are. So, I'm going to put it right where you'll see it. <laughs> Don't provoke them, he says, to wrath. But, bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That is, you have a responsibility in how you bring them up. Cram the Bible down their throat. Amen. That's what he's saying. The nurture and admonition, not that you see best, of the Lord. That's your job. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3 verse 21. He says, Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. So that is, you should value your children. They have value. Furthermore, they're not going to always stay children. One day they're going to have to change your diaper. <laughs> Get ready. Because if you've been provoking them to anger, the tables one day are going to turn. Watch it. <laughs> it's a reminder. <laughs> You're not so big. <laughs> Look at 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy 1. He says, when I, uh, this is Paul talking about Timothy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother, Lois, and thy mother, Eunice, and I am persuaded that uh, in thee, I am persuaded that in thee also. So he's saying there, this is a hereditary thing. It passed down. Grandma gave it to her daughter, and she passed it on to you. Now, there's no father mentioned here, so I don't know if his dad is dead or what's going on, but he obviously was raised by a single mom and said that she was raising him the way that God intended her to. She passed on the faith to him. He was strong in the faith. That's what our job to do as parents. Look at uh, chapter 3, 2 Timothy 3. 2 Timothy 3, verse 15. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. 
does that mean that he just from a child always loved the the scriptures no it means it was crammed down his throat till he learned to love it <laughs> do you you know the big thing is broccoli kids don't like to eat broccoli for some reason i don't know why i like broccoli but there's always something they don't like to eat that's good for them uh, like donuts you know they, you know <laughs> There's always something good for the kid that they don't want to eat. And the parent doesn't say, oh, well, I'm going to wait until you get old enough to decide whether or not you like this. No, you're going to eat some of it. Okay, I know, I know you don't like it, but we're going to sit here until you finish that little portion I gave you. <laughs> There's not going to be any dessert until that's off your plate, you know, down your throat, not to the dog. <laughs> he says the scripture was the same way. He loved it because it was fed to him. As a child, he would not have been able to read it. Somebody had to read it to him. Somebody had to pump him full of, this is the Bible stories. We're going to have, you know, Bible story. I used to love this. When I would come to, when we lived down here, and this I would have, been, we left here when I was seven, I think. So this would have been younger than that. So probably five, six, somewhere around in there. We would go to Memphis, where my grandparents lived, and we would stay with them for Christmas. And my uncle um, would be out on a date or something. He would come home late. But I used to love it when he would come in. Everybody else was in bed and asleep. And I would wait up till he came home. When he came home, he's a storyteller. And when he came home, he would tell me a Bible story. And that was the highlight of the Christmas season. But that's what's going on with Timothy here. The parents were making sure that he knew the scripture and he had a love for it. Make it fun. If you can, make it fun. You know, make it... There's Dr. Seuss has not got the, uh, the capital on a kid's attention. <laughs> God can get it too. Tell them those stories. He's got them in there for a reason. Ephesians 6 verse 5. Ephesians 6 verse 5. Now we're into territory that we're probably more comfortable with, but not comfortable. Servants. Okay, that's no longer, that's not me. I'm not a servant. I'm not a master and I'm not a servant. Uh -oh. <laughs> but then we're not comfortable because that's a taboo subject. Servants. Nobody should have slaves. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's let the Bible tell us what the Bible says. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of heart, as unto Christ. Paul's given instruction here, just like he did at the beginning, uh, children obey your parents in the Lord, so this is uh, the Christian thing to do. A Christian servant should be doing this, obeying his master. Um, people will apply this, to the employer-employee relationship. You can do that if you want to. It's not what the Bible's saying, but you can do that. If that's what you need to do so that you get some instruction, do it. However, don't, don't say that's what it's saying. It literally said servants. It literally said masters. Paul's talking in a time when what would come to the church was a master with his servant. So he's preaching to them both. They're both there. Um, this is not a treatise on whether or not servants and masters should exist. This was a fact. They did exist and God had something to say. Look at 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy 6. Slavery in our day and age only uh, seems to flourish in pagan countries which is the Indians and the Muslims they love servants because they serve their master the devil he never came to earth and said I've come to set the captive free so what's he do he puts them in slavery so they put everybody they can in slavery 1st Timothy 6 verse 1 let as many Servants, as they're under the yoke, count their own masters worthy of all honor. Now we're right back to children, honor your parents. That honor thing. It's all the way through there. 
anybody that you're supposed to be uh, under, you're supposed to do, give them due honor. He says, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren. He said, you might have a master who's saved. Don't start thinking, how dare he have, we're, we're both Christians, how dare he? No, he says, be glad that you've got a master that is saved. Not despise them because they're brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. If any man teach otherwise, now, do men teach otherwise? Sure they do. If they teach otherwise, here's who they are. And consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine, which is according to godliness, he's proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railing, evil, evil surmising, perverse disputing of men, corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such withdraw thyself, or you'll no longer be able to honor your master. Because you get in bad company, it changes your way of thinking. 1 Peter 2. 1 Peter 2, verse 18. 1 Peter 2, 18. We see a word that we've seen so far with every relationship that does apply to us. Children, parents, husband, wife, all are to be in subjection to someone. So servants are going to be no exception. Servants be subject to your masters there it is plain as day with all fear now this is where it gets good not so good if you're a servant <laughs> y'all know where i am first peter 2 18 not only to the good and gentle but also to the froward mm. this is a very big exception that's not the way he said you raise your children. There he said, don't make your children discouraged. Don't provoke them to anger. Here he's saying, don't worry about it whether or not you were provoked to anger. If you're a master, if you're in the servant-master relationship, if you're the servant and your master's provoked you to anger, I don't care be in subjection to them he says for this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward god endure grief suffering wrongfully Whew. Whew. that is tough stuff now you know where we are the book of uh, first peter doctrinally where does that land tribulation. tribulation you know what's going to be happening in the tribulation the servant master thing's coming back They've already got it in the Middle East. And it's going to be popular there. They're going to need to know what to do and how to respond. So he put it in there. That's tough stuff. He says uh, the froward. So the froward there is probably, this is more than likely, an unsaved person that he's talking about, a froward master. And he says that froward is the opposite of good and gentle. So he's bad and mean <laughs> evil and yeah evil and cruel that's right and so the servant there is supposed to do it as unto the lord and as we get farther into this we'll pick that subject up some more um but that's all i've prepared for tonight so y'all can go home late <laughs>